Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today, we're starting a brand new message series entitled, World Under Attack. There's no mistake or surprise that our faith is under attack. But it only starts with our faith. It will end with the loss of the world's freedom. Make no mistake, what's going on affects everyone. Each and every one of us is affected, not just Christians. It affects the whole world because the whole world is under attack. You can see it all around you. It's in the TV shows. It's in the ceremonies. It has infiltrated our sports, schools, our politics. It's like what Ray Stevens said about Santa Claus. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. I'm talking about the occult. I'm talking about false religion. I'm talking about political oppression. June 25th, 1962, the report rang out. U.S. Supreme Court declares prayer unconstitutional in public schools. That act, the taking of prayer out of public schools, was a shot across the good ship Christian faith and our country has been on a downward spiral ever since. Here's what Psalm 33 verse 12 says. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The blessing of the Lord God is upon those who cling to him, upon those who obey his word and obey his commands. Proverbs 14 verse 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. This word reproach is the Hebrew word, and I quote, it's hasad. It means disgrace, shameful, that is a moral evil, that is a sexual misbehavior with a focus on the embarrassing behavior before God or society, end of quote. This proverb is being lived out daily with the latest disgraceful, shameful, sexual misbehavior with a moral evil and anyone with any type of morality will find it an offense and embarrassing behavior before both God and society. I'm talking about the 2024 Olympics opening ceremony where they depicted the Last Supper portrayed by men dressed as women and a woman portraying our Lord. The public artistic director, Thomas Jolly said, we wanted something that would unite people. We didn't want anything subversive. They wanted to unite and not subvert. What is more subversive than what they did? Do they even know what the meaning of unite is? I just wonder. Or did they mean that they intended to unite people against Christianity? You tell me. Apparently, even Egypt's Al-Azhar, a Sunni Muslim leader, said it was insulting to Jesus in a reckless and barbaric way. And he's a Muslim. Christians around the world should have been shocked, outraged, and offended at this blatant disregard for their Lord and Savior, and should have turned the Olympics off at that point. But instead, Christians overlook, we compromise, and we make excuses. But instead, we need to stand up and say, no more. We will no longer be marginalized. We will no longer stand silently aside and say nothing while our Lord and Savior is being mocked and degraded. We will not participate. We will not watch and we will not be an accessory. This is not art, nor is it designed for inclusivity. This is nothing more than an attempt at forced compliance and an all-out attack on your faith. And if you don't stand now, you will have nothing left to stand for later. 
nor will there be anyone left to stand with. This is not about Christians versus secular. It's not about Republicans versus Democrats. It's about freedom. Freedom to choose. Freedom to prosper. Freedom to live. Freedom to be happy. In short, this affects everybody. Don't wait until it's too late. Stand up, speak up, vote up, and let yourself be heard because it affects each and every one of us. With that said, please join me for a message today. It affects everyone. Turn with me to our scripture reading found in Psalms 2 verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The governments of the world have sold themselves to the elite, who have sold themselves to do evil. They become sexually immoral and unholy, just like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single bowl of stew. They have kicked God out of their senates, their parliaments, their countries. Some have even kicked God out of their churches. The elites have confiscated the world's resources and have embezzled the wealth of nations, leaving the people poor and destitute completely stripped of their assets and their possessions. According to Forbes.com, as of May 30th, 2024, the U.S. has surpassed $1 trillion in quarterly interest on our public debt. That is $1 trillion every three months just in interest alone to a private for-profit bank that loans fiat or fake money and then buys real assets with the proceeds. Let that sink in for just a minute or two. But as I said, it does not just affect Christians, but it affects each and every one of us. They get away with things like the opening ceremony for the Olympics because it appeals to the person's natural appetite to be entertained. We become lovers of self rather than lovers of God. Oh, my country is competing, therefore I must watch. They love sports, they love the Olympics, but if there are no watchers, if there are no participants, no interests, there would be no venue for indoctrinating, no venue for programming the people. We stand silent as others are persecuted because it does not affect me. So I don't want to get involved. I'm not political. But what you don't realize is that it will affect you eventually. Martin Neumuller, a prominent German Lutheran pastor who sympathized with many of the Nazi ideas and supported radical right-wing political movements in the 1920s and early 30s said this, and I quote, First, they came for the socialist. I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist. I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me." End of quote. Neumuller spent eight years of his life in Nazi prisons and concentration camps because by the time he realized that the noose was also tightening around his own neck, it was too late. Like Mordecai told Queen Esther in Esther chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. 
but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So don't believe, don't fool yourself into thinking that you alone will stand because you're not a Christian. Don't believe that you will somehow find favor even though you no longer identify with what they're doing because it now affects you or a family member. When it affects you personally, that changes everything. Someone once said, and I quote, they're not coming after me, they're coming after you. I'm just standing in their way, end of quote. That should be a wake up call for every one of us. Look, there's coming a time and I believe that time is already here when you will have to make a choice. Either you'll be for Jesus and for righteousness or you will be for evil and for the occult. The book of Revelation says this about the time that we're living in, the time that is coming. It says that no one will be able to buy, sell, or trade without a certain mark. Let us read that. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 through 18. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Six, six, six. There is a second beast, Revelation says, that rises up out of the earth with two horns like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. It will exercise great power to perform great miracles, great signs, and even to make fire come down from heaven to the earth in front of all of the people. With these great signs that it is allowed to perform, it will deceive the people of the earth, just like they're being deceived right now, only on a more intense scale. The second beast will force the inhabitants of the world to worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Anyone who refuses to worship will be slain. This is not a fairy tale. This is not some old wives tale. This is reality. This is for real. It's near and it's pendant. And I don't believe that God loves you too much that you alone will escape. If you escape, it's only through death that you will escape. Here's what the scripture says about that third angel. Revelation chapter 14, verse nine through 11. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever received the mark of its name. The church will still be here on the earth during this period of time. Otherwise, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 would not make much sense. At the very least, it would be misleading, if not outright deceitful. Here's what it says. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads 
or their hands. Whom did John the Revelator see? The souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. That's who John the Revelator saw in heaven. If the church was not still here, why would it be so important for John to point that little fact out to us? But the plain truth and the rude awakening is, we will be here. The church will be here in the earth. This is the generation that will see all this take place. For Satan has come down having great wrath because he knows his time is short. Satan does not come down as a nice, friendly chap, but as a formidable villain. Don't believe the lie that some have tried to sell us, that Satan is a toothless lion who can only roar and no more. Over and over, we are warned of his tactics. Over and over again, we see the aftermath of his ragings. We are not wrestling against some insignificant, weak, no account opponent. Neither is he stupid, but rather he is much stronger than we are, much wiser than we are. Just think, he has turned the whole world against God, against its own creator. There are more on the broad road with him than there are on the straight and narrow road that leads to life. Imagine, he is selling death and the world is buying. Let us revisit our scripture reading for this message, Psalm 2 verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The nations of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The nations of the world, led by the elites of the world, have not only kicked God out of their country and have turned to the occult, but they have declared war on him as well. Again, this is not fantasy, nor is it some conspiracy theory. Just take a look at any of the ceremonies at big events, like this year's opening ceremony for the Olympics 2024, the Commonwealth Games 2022, or the bizarre ceremony for the opening of Switzerland's world's longest railroad tunnel that provides a link between Northern and Southern Europe. It was laden with occult symbology. Check out the Grammys or take a look at most music videos. It's in our movies. It's in our children's cartoons. It's all over and it's in everything. This is not without its consequences of growing hatred for Christianity. I received this the other day and I think it's appropriate for us right now. It says, and I quote, first we overlook evil, then we permit evil, then we legalize evil, then we promote evil, then we celebrate evil, then we persecute those who still call it evil, end of quote. And so said, so done. If you're not with their agenda, if you're not celebrating their agenda, then they will persecute you. They will attack your finances, attack your job, your business, and will, will not relent until you are completely and totally ruined. Religionnews.com wrote this, and again I quote, in an interview with the Washington Times, retired Lieutenant General William Boykin, a former commander of Delta Force and Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, said the attacks indicate an increased religious intolerance that could hit closer to home. 
He warned that Christian persecution is only going to grow unless we wake up and start taking a very strong stand against this, end of quote. The attacks that the Lieutenant General was talking about are the attacks on Christians around the world. Elon Musk tweeted something very similar recently. Listen to this. In case you did not realize, listen to this. According to opendoorsus.org, 4,998 Christians were murdered for their faith last year. That is 4,998 souls that they know of. That would equate to almost 14 Christians a day. Killed because they believe that Jesus is God. And that he died that we might live. They estimate that 365 million Christians around the world suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination because of their faith. 295,120 Christians were forced to leave their homes and go into hiding in country or had to leave their country altogether. The nations rage and the people plot in vain. But God is not unnerved, nor is he perplexed. For the next three verses, verses 4, 5, and 6, says this about what God thinks. Psalm 2, verse 4 through 6. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. God is not overly concerned with their raging. Matter of fact, God is not concerned about their raging at all, for he sits enthroned in the heavens and he laughs at their feeble attempt to dethrone him. He holds them in derision. He holds them in scorn or in mockery or in disdain. They do not threaten him, nor do they worry him. Neither do they make him anxious. God, is God Almighty. In his time, he will speak to them in his wrath. He will terrify them in his fury. He will not let any of them escape. Therefore, it is best to take his advice. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Psalm 2, verse 10 and 11. Be wise and serve the Lord with fear and trembling, he says, because his wrath will flare up in a moment, but his steadfast love will last forever. Tell me, would you rather, out of pride or out of self-gain, face the wrath of God? Or would you rather enjoy his steadfast love that lasts forever? It is easy to enjoy his steadfast love forever and ever. All you have to do is to come to him in repentance. Meaning, you must turn from your evil ways. Turn from wickedness and embrace the things of God. You must turn from a life of sensuality and lust to a life of righteousness and pure love. Would you like to know that steadfast love of God today? Would you like to know him as Lord and Savior? Be at peace with him. If you would, all you have to do is to repeat this prayer after me and mean it. Here's how we do it. Our Heavenly Father, forgive me for I have sinned. I am the one that needs repentance. And I do come to you with a repentant heart, asking for your forgiveness, asking you for life that I might live in eternity with you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I accept your free gift of life today. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. 
If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to find yourself a Bible, whether you have to go out and buy one or you take it off your bookshelf. Open your Bible, begin to read it. Start anywhere in your Bible, but if you have to start at a certain place, start in John. It's the fourth book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Start reading. In, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Begin to read, and read it with an open heart. Next thing I want you to do is to find a Bible-believing church. One who believes in righteousness, who believes in holiness. Not one who embraces the things of this world and accepts whatever the world gives them. But one who believes that Jesus is coming back for a holy and righteous bride. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny H. This is Holy Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.